So I think we're live now. So um, welcome everyone to our virtual IoT meetup. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, my name's Ian Scarrett. Usually Benjamin Cabe is is the host, but um, he's uh, away at a conference in Marseille, France. So um, I'm here with Matthias Kovac, who is a IoT researcher at ETH Zurich, a university in in, in Switzerland. And so Ma Matthias, thank you very much for for joining us today. Um, it's great to have you. Sure. So, hey there. And um, so what Matthias is going to be talking about today is is um, around sensor networks, kind of connecting uh, sensor networks. And um, I, th I think this is a fascinating topic. Um, actually, I was at a, a meetup last night um, uh, in, here in Ottawa, and the, the, the conversation was around mesh networks. So, so um, very similar. Um, and, and looking forward to to, to your your presentation. Just a, a few kind of logistical things. Um, what we're going to do is is there's a Q and A for the Q, uh, 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 Google Hangout. So please, um, if you have questions as Matthias is speaking, um, ask them there. And then what we'll do is is at the end we'll go through the the Q and A. Um, for we also will I'll follow the on Twitter um, the virtual IoT hashtag. Um, so if you want to ask something on Twitter, feel free. Um, and at the end we always have a. a a, a question for people at the end, and uh, the people, the person that answers the question first, and it's based on the content. The person that answers first um, will will uh, wins a prize with a, a greenhouse starter kit. So this is a demo um, uh, kit that Benjamin's put together, um, including a Raspberry Pi and, and a number of different sensors that we'll we'll send out to you. Um, so, so um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, to Matthias, and um, and thank you again. I'm looking forward to to the the presentation. Yeah, hi. thanks, Ian, for this nice introduction. Um, hey, everybody. So, um, yeah, it's about connecting sensor networks. I'll start sharing my screen now. Do you have the slides? Screen start. So I hope you can see that. Um, yep, we can see it. That's great. So yeah, I'm a researcher at ETH Zurich. And yeah, I came from the background from wireless sensor networks and slid into the topic of Internet of Things. And that's what I yeah, will share with you today. So the agenda is a bit like this. So I will give you a short introduction what wireless sensor networks are, um, where they came from, what, what was the intro. Um, yeah, first idea behind that. I'll then give you a short introduction to 6 low pan, which is basically the, the missing piece that then allowed to connect sensor networks directly to the internet. And uh, then I'll become quite practical. Um, I, I liked it very much uh, from Benjamin's talk uh, last time. So we, we're going to see um, how you can bring your own sensor network uh, to the internet. And there, I'll focus on the connecting part and provide pointers um, how to yeah, get uh, sensor nodes running. So um, you'll see uh, how to use Contiki for that. And I'll provide a short outlook on um, what kind of uh, challenges uh, lie ahead. And as already mentioned, uh, you can ask questions. So there is this uh, Twitter feed, or uh, use the Hangouts Q&A uh, that you can um, yeah, open through, through your menu. So yeah, wireless sensor networks. Uh, the idea is actually pretty old. Um, it started. Even before the year 2000, um, professors in, in Berkeley basically had this uh, initial idea to have something yeah, really small, like dust-sized um, modes that you can um, just simply deploy uh, over an environment to monitor this environment. Um, of course, there's this uh, military interest in this, uh, but also yeah, uh, civil uh, en environment monitoring for, for yeah, preserving nature and so on. So, uh, they built something uh, pretty small, what you can see here on, on this small coin, um, that initially communicated via light, so using small mirrors to, to signal what's, what's going on. Um, it, it was the first prototype to see whether you can get something actually that small that you can yeah, produce cheap and, and just deploy over a huge area. Um, where, where it went from there, you can see in the middle, so uh, slightly larger platforms, um, yeah, that, that could be realized easily, and that's basically how it came to, to the research field of wireless sensor networks that started yeah, after the, the year 2000. Um, so they produced uh, several different hardware platforms that yeah, were quite larger than the initial vision 
Um, however, they, they reflected the technology of the time and it allowed um, yeah, really practical research um, in, in this area. So the, the focus was really on the resource constraints you had in these environments. So um, the platforms are usually, um, yeah, just have a microcontroller, just a few kilobytes of, of RAM and ROM. So you, you had to design protocols in the, in the right way. And everything was very, yeah, focused on, on the application. So the, the usual way how you connected these sensor networks was with a sync node and then basically had custom software. So it was kind of a shell you were provided. Um, but every time you had to use this specific software stack to communicate and, and get this single node and then you had to do something custom. So an example for that is, is TinyDB. It's a pretty nice idea. So you have uh, some node that is connected to, to a PC or some, some normal computer. And uh, here, for instance, you could uh, formulate queries like uh, SQL queries um, to get values out of this network. The thing is, it, it, it's really nice. It, the, these approaches that provide you nice abstractions, but they, they usually only work for homogeneous networks. So every mode is the same. They all perform the same application. And yeah, that, that's good for wireless sensor networks. Um, but yeah, um, we want to go towards the, the Internet of Things. And there it's about yeah, heterogeneous devices. We want to connect all devices we can have at home and in, around the city, in smart factories, and so on. And so it's, it's heterogeneity. And we need something better to, to connect this. And yeah, a good way is definitely to use the Internet IP. And actually, pretty early, there was already the idea about uh, using IP in these constrained environments. So yeah, actually both, both publications were from the year 2003 where yeah, one of uh, the pioneers was uh, Adam Dunkels um, who proposed this idea using uh, full TCP IP for 8-bit micro uh, controllers. And um, basically that's what um, he was already working on in the Contiki operating system. It's originally, it started as a as a retro computing project, so it's uh, kind of implemented a web server on the old C64, but this kind of environment was exactly what we had with these constrained sensor nodes, and so it, it uh, developed and was ported to, to lots of different wireless sensor network platforms, render. So the, the other pioneer, for instance, was uh, Zach Shelby, so he had uh, published a paper around the same time, and this, this idea was born, hey, Let's use IP to, to really connect sensor networks and yeah, to provide a better infrastructure for applications. So yeah, the next part will be yeah, giving a short introduction to six low pan and, and what it is and, and what it does. So um, here you can see a normal uh, low power IP stack. Um, what you have at the bottom is usually what, what we had in a wireless sensor network. So there's, for instance, this 802.15.4 radio. Um, that's the one that was also used uh, for Zigbee, for instance. So it's often called the Zigbee radio, although Zigbee does, does more than just the, the physical and, and Mac layer. Um, there, there are things like a radio duty cycling that was developed in, in the area of wireless sensor networks uh, to, to save energy, to, to be able to communicate, but with uh, very, very low duty cycle and still, um, yeah, fulfill the, the, the needs of the application. Um, you also see something blue at the network layer, so that's the routing protocols that, that were needed for, for this multi-hop communication you, you have in wireless sensor networks. So the one that is now standardized and, uh, yeah, a huge piece in, in the puzzle of uh, the Internet of Things is the Ripple protocol, the routing protocol for low power and lossy networks. And yet, yeah, this is at the network layer. And at the network layer, we now really have IPv6. And that makes it really easy to connect wireless sensor networks in, in your IT infrastructure. <coughs> Sorry. And yet, yeah, to make this work on these small platforms, you, you have this small adaption layer, basically, be below IPv6. And that's 6 low pan. It's basically IPv6 for low power wireless personal area networks. Um, pretty awkward acronym, it's, it's long term, so 6 low pan is, is yet an uh, adaption layer to, to make IPv6 work in these constrained environments. So the usual transport flow for that is usually uh, UDP, because TCP doesn't uh, perform that well if you have uh, these lossy and low power links with multi-hop communication. So um, UDP 
is a good choice. And uh, at the application layer, something that's now, yeah, becoming quite popular is, is co-op, the constraint application protocol um, that also deals, deals a bit with the lossiness of uh, UDP, so it provides reliability and it uh, implements the REST architectural style to, to develop applications. But the focus of this talk is, yeah, connecting wireless sensor networks. Wireless sensor networks are edge networks. So if this is uh, the normal setup you would have at home, it looks basically similar in, in your company or university and so on. And what you do, you provide a border router that basically does this six low pen adaption for you. And then you have this uh, low pen network, the low power network uh, with the modes, but this is an edge network, so there's no traversing traffic through it. So that's why it's, it's easy to, to have um, the adaption there and also, yeah, to, to compress certain parts and really um, deal with the constraints you have in, in, in this low power communication. To, to understand how this fully works with the integration, um, I want to have a short look at uh, IPv6 addressing or addresses, how, how they're built up. So they're, they're rather large, so you have uh, 128 bits or 16 bytes, and they are structured like this. So the first eight bytes are the prefix. Um, that kind of tells you what kind of address this is. So for instance, is it just a unicast address or is it a multicast address? And then it has a routing prefix. So it already contains information where this thing should go. And based on these prefixes, routers can decide where, where to forward IP packets. And then the second half, the, the other eight bytes, um, are for the interface identifier. So that tells you which network card is this, or if you don't have that many interfaces, which machine is behind this, this address. And then you have uh, this slash notation where you basically have the number of fixed bits in your prefix. Um, I'll, you'll see some examples later. So it means basically from the first part, from the access, how many bits are fixed, and then you know the remaining ones that you can choose for yeah, dividing or creating subnets, for instance, and so on. So um, there are some other notations around. So for instance, leading zeros in these blocks can be omitted, so you can have something that only has uh, three uh, hex digits, for instance, and whole blocks that are zero can also be omitted by using the colon twice. So, so this um, would mean where you see the two colons, um, you have only zero blocks, and um, this, for instance, uh, would be a, a prefix because, yeah, it's just zeros until the end, so there are also all the uh, interface identifiers are zero. So just that you know how, yeah, what this means, how, how these addresses look like. Um, some examples, um, the new or IPv6 localhost address is, for instance, colon colon 1 slash 128. So all 128 bits are fixed. You cannot yeah, modify anything. So that's what it means to have a yeah, final address to, to address uh, an interface. Um, the default route is basically similar to IPv4, uh, only zeros. So you'll have only zeros. So you have the, the colons there and then yeah, slash zero. Other examples is the so-called link local address that you will encounter quite often. Um, this FE80 prefix basically means, okay, this address is just has a meaning on this link. So basically the, the switch or the, the ethernet that is directly connected to, to my uh, network interface, but I cannot route these addresses across the internet. And another example is this FF prefix. Then you know, okay, this is a multicast address. Um, and then you, you use this prefix and, and the other bits basically to, to identify the, the multicast groups and so on. Okay, what, what, how does it work if you want to connect your wireless sensor networks? So the central thing is you need an ISP that provides you with a prefix um, that gives you some space for, for subnets. So uh, something good is if you have a slash 48 prefix, for instance. Um, that's provided by uh, ISP. And then you can create one subnet, for instance, for your normal backbone, your, your Ethernet around with a slash 64. You see it's basically putting everything um, to zero here. And um, your router address, for instance, would look this. And then you have your border router, and you give it an, an address in, in the same subnet. So for instance, um, the number 10 in, in with the same prefix. And then you assign a new subnet address that uh, yeah, denotes your low pan. And 
then every node will use this, this prefix, so that's the indicator with kafi 10 and will add its own MAC address, basically. That's um, the stateless approach, how you create full IPv6 addresses. It adds the MAC address to, to this prefix. And then you have a full routable global IP address for actually every single sensor node. And that's, that's quite interesting. So really, you, you connect every single device directly to the internet. And then, of course, you can take care of this with firewall rules and so on to, to, to make it secure. But it's nice to have this possibility of this direct accessibility from the internet. So to, to get this a bit more practical, how can you do this at home? So um, you need your own IPv6 prefix. So either you have a nice ISP, as we saw uh, Benjamin, for instance, has. Um, then you, you, you get this already um, out of the box. The other way is um, you just get an IPv6 tunnel. Um, that's quite interesting. Uh, one example, um, the, the one I use, for instance, is uh, Hurricane Electric, uh, where you can register at uh, tunnelbroker.net. And once you registered, you will um, basically give some information. You receive an email, and with that you can log in. And then you have this, this, this overview. Um, yeah, you can create up to five tunnels. And if you want to, to create one for, for your wireless sensor network, for instance, uh, you choose Create Regular Tunnel. You enter your one IP, so this is the IPv4 address, basically your router receives from your ISP. You put it here. Um, usually, if you do this from home, it does it automatically because that's the, the address from where you're viewing this website. And then you choose an uh, entry point of the tunnel that is somewhat close to you. So there are uh, quite some options here. And um, yeah, pick something close. will give you the best performance. Once this is done, the tunnel is created. You will already see a um, lot of addresses, a lot of information. Um, we'll come back to this later. Uh, the important next step is that you also assign a slash 48 prefix. At the moment, um, you only have a slash 64. That means a single subnet. But since you want to route into your own low pants behind that, you, you need this um, smaller prefix um, to, to provide the possibility to, to structure uh, the, the on-site network. So you click there, and then you will uh, also have a slash 48 prefix. Next step, um, you will need a router that has nice IPv6 support. And um, yeah, usually the, the commercial firmware uh, yeah, don't have that, that good support for, for that, unfortunately. Um, so you can um, basically choose a custom firmware and flash your router with that one. Um, whatever you have, there, there are many choices around. Just um, yeah, pick one that has good support for your model. Um, that's basically you can figure out from uh, forums and their like. And yeah, you will find a lot of support online, how you actually do it, how you flash the router, um, what distributions are there. For instance, this DD, WRT, or Tomato, these are uh, firmwares you can use for, for your router. So the one, one I'm using, for instance, is uh, Tomato by Shibi. Um, it's a continuation of the original Tomato USB firmware. You can uh, find it under this address. Um, you have to um, look what, what kind of router you have. So for instance, the, the, the good old one, which is quite open, the WRT54, um, is pretty old and it, the, the, the flash is quite small. So um, the, the newer builds um, with the native IPv6 support, unfortunately, do not fit. So um, you can also find a model list with um, most uh, distributions of these, these firmwares. Um, they look like this and you get a nice overview. Um, yeah, what models are there and you can check whether the one you have is already there, and you also have the information uh, about the flash size, so you know um, yeah, what, what uh, images would fit. If you have pretty old ones, or if you just want to get a dedicated one for, for your sensor network, I can give you these two examples. Uh, one is uh, uh, Linksys, the E900. It's, it's quite cheap, and uh, yeah, it, it works with uh, the Tomato uh, firmware. The other one is the Netgear WRN 3500. Um, it has a few more features. It's quite nice. It has the USB connector. You can do printer sharing and so on. It's slightly more expensive, but uh, it's also yeah, working very well. So to, to flash the, the whole router, um, just um, 
a few steps. And the first one, what you should know, is the so-called 30-30-30. That's um, yeah, how you do a hard reset. It basically means that you, um, while the router is on, you press the reset button for 30 seconds, then you remove the power plug, you still hold the reset button for 30 seconds, then you plug it back in with the power on, still holding the reset button, and um, after 30, the, the last 30 seconds you release, you have a, a hard reset, so all the internal memory um, will be deleted. The, the firmware is still on, so all the, the configuration and custom um, parts are gone. And then you can um, yeah, go to the normal web interface, and uh, most routers already have a nice upgrade mechanism in the web uh, interface. Uh, so usually it's under administration, firmware upgrade, and yeah, then you just uh, browse the, the the image you download it from from the distribution website, and yeah, click upgrade. It takes a while, and then you will have your your own image. And yeah, if you need help, there's lots of help out there. It's just Google this, uh, include the name uh, of the firmware, uh, your router model, and you you will be lucky. Okay, so this is uh, how the Tomato Web GUI looks like. Um, there, you basically go to basic IPv6, and you choose the 6 and 4 static tunnel. And then you'll need this information uh, from the Tunnel Broker website um, that you need to fill in in the right fields. So for instance, under assigned router prefix, obviously, you need the routed slash 48 prefix. Uh, for instance, 2001-470 cafe and zeros. Um, note that there is no slash 48 in this field. Uh, that one comes in the small field below it. For the router, you just use this prefix and add the, the one. So you put um, yeah, just zeros for, for this subnet and have this information here. And then you need the server IPv4 address. Um, you, you will yeah, see the name on, on, on the right on this small snippet, um, which address that would be that goes here. And you need the client IPv6 address that goes here. And then you're basically done. Then you already have um, IPv6 support in your network, so your normal laptop that connects via Wi-Fi or whatever you connect to, to Ethernet will have um, IPv6 support and uh, yeah, have uh, IPv6 address assigned and you can connect to the Internet using this protocol. What we want to do next is um, we go under administration scripts because we need to, to add some routing entries that are necessary to connect to, to the 6 low pan. So, um, yeah, just this is this line. Um, the IP tool, for instance, allows you to, to add these routes. Um, so what we have is um, this is basically the prefix for the 6 low pan, which we want to route into. And we just say, OK, which one is the gateway? And there we use uh, a fixed address. And we will assign this address later to, to some kind of gateway. Another thing, if you want to access your modes from remotely, um, you should open your firewall. Um, here's an example how you yeah, directly make a port accessible. Um, have a look at the IPv6 tables manual uh, for more options. For instance, it would make sense that you also do filtering on the source. So for instance, you could have a proxy in between that, that does some more um, yeah, better filtering of who can access your, your sensor nodes and yeah, who is not allowed. OK, now we have the routing part basically done. Um, now we need something to connect to, to the um, 6 low pan, so where we have this, this low power radio technology. So um, if you really want to deploy something, it's, it's good to use something like the Raspberry Pi or, or the BeagleBone. Um, they, they, they consume less energy and, and they, they yeah, work nicely. Um, if you're not familiar with these devices, for instance, if you don't know how to cross-compile uh, some software for, for these devices, um, you can also make a shortcut and just use a normal Linux PC um, that you connect to, to your router and then connect uh, the border router to, to this PC. So what do you need to configure on, on, on this piece, so either the Raspberry or, or this PC? So connect to it SSH or you're sitting directly in front of it and you need to add this uh, static IPv6 address I was um, showing in the slides before in the web interface. So this uh, cafe 10 address, we give it to, to the gateway. And then you need to make sure to enable routing in the kernel. So that's sometimes um, disabled and can cause a lot of headache. Um, you can use this. Um, 
uh, probably the sudo is missing here on the small beetle bone, for instance, you, you are root anyway. I'll fix this. So sudo echo one to this uh, proc file system thing, and then routing will be enabled. And then the, the last step that is missing to install the border router. So that basically means to connect a small sensor node to your gateway to, to bridge into the different radio technology. I can give you an, an overview of what is out there. So a classic one that you also saw in um, Benjamin's demo last time is the T-Mode Sky, or also known as the Telos B. The thing is, it's, it's quite old and uh, quite hard to get because it's not produced anymore. So um, you can, for instance, search for this MPM uh, name here and we'll find some, some, some suppliers where you might get it. it. The thing is, it's uh, around in the research community because, yeah, it has been around for a long time. And it's quite convenient because of the USB connector. You can just plug it in and program it directly without any additional hardware. But as I said, it's quite old, so there are some newer alternatives. For instance, the Solacia Z1 uh, is quite handy and works pretty similar. It uses the same uh, tool chains. It's also an MSP430, and there's also a USB connector. You might notice the small uh, micro-USB jack on, on the board. Another thing um, that's quite nice is the open mode. Um, so that's a rather new platform. It comes with a nice system on the chip, the uh, TICC2538. Uh, um, it's also available with a crypto accelerator. It might be interesting if you want to secure um, your network later. And yeah, there's growing support for it. So it, it's becoming easier and easier to, to, to work with these devices. Another yeah, well-known one is the Econotech, actually. Um, that's available from, from Red Wire LSC. Oh, that's great. I'm so sorry. I don't know why this happened. Okay, so now you know what, what kind of hardware you can choose. Now we need the software. And the good choice is Contiguous. It has a great support for 6 low pan. And there's also a big community behind it, so you find lots of uh, yeah, support online. There's a mailing list where kind of every issue has been discussed already, so you will find a lot of help there. So you can get it from GitHub, just clone, um, yeah, basically this resp resp repository. And um, yeah, once you have it, the re relevant projects you, you will need are in Contiki slash examples slash IPv6. And as I said, um, if you're not familiar with Contiki OS, it goes a bit um, too far, is a bit out of scope of this uh, for this small talk. Um, go online as a nice wiki, or for instance, the, the mode uh, vendors also provide uh, getting started guides to get Contiki running on, on the platforms. Another nice thing you could check out is the 6LBR project by Setix. So this is kind of a uh, out-of-the-box contiguous uh, border router that you can deploy, for instance, on the Raspberry Pi. And they even have their own um, hardware, so a small shield that you can put on the Raspberry Pi to, to have this 15.4 uh, radio directly on, on the mode. So um, this could also be interesting if you want to connect your sensor network. So. If you want to do it manually, it's quite good to understand what's what's actually going on. Um, you can go into Contiki Examples IPv6, and you'll basically have two options. The old one is uh, using the old Ripple border router, and there you have the Ripple border router project, so it's a directory in this IPv6 uh, folder, and that will be the one that is running on the mode. So you can use a make target sky if you have the T mode sky, otherwise you need to choose a different target here. And then you do, for, for the sky, for instance, a border router dot upload. And then it will compile, build, link everything, and upload it directly to the mode. So there you see already why, why the T-Mode Sky is uh, so convenient. You just plug it in, and you call make, and everything is done for you. And the second part um, you need for, for this approach is the Tunslip 6 uh, tool. So that's um, contained somewhere else in Contiki Tools. And that's the one that will be running on the gateway. So your Raspberry Pi, BeetleBone, or the laptop, or whatever you chose to, to make it convenient. And then you just make do a make tonslip to, to compile it. 
And you can configure, for instance, a good uh, ARM cross compiler, for instance, if you want to copy it to the gateway. The other approach, um, the new one that I would recommend, is using the native border router. So what's different is that on the mode, you only have a slip radius, basically only some logic to send out the, the, the frames for, for this uh, low power radio. And yeah, you do it the, the same way. You make it make target sky, slip radio upload, and then you have this radio there. And then the, the actual border router with all the, the lists for the routing tables and so on, that will be the, the, the one running on your gateway. And for that, you do a make border router, and you compile it. And then you, you also have an executable, just like the TonSlip 6. OK, now we have most of it in place. Now we just start the border router that you do with sudo, and then whatever you choose, the TonSlip 6 or the border router.native that will fall out of, from the other project, um, you give it the, the address it should use, which also defines the prefix um, for your 6 low pen. So here, see again this Cathy 10. Um, I picked as an example for for the 6 low pen. And that, that call will also open a, a TAN0 interface that you can use for routing. And it actually automatically adds the routes to, to forward packets that are addressed to this, uh, uh, with this prefix to, to the 6 low pen network. So if you execute that, you will see something like this. So you get some status information. So it's uh, Contiki 3.x, for instance, running here. Um, the, the line that says Mac, null Mac, RDC is quite interesting. Um, there you can check uh, what kind of configuration you have. So if um, later sensor node is not talking to your border router, you can check whether, for instance, they, they have the same configuration here. The really important part is down here. So that's the border router address. That's the one you want to copy. You want to store it. If you use, uh, I would recommend to use the same mode always for, for the border router. You, you save this address somewhere. And then you can actually add it to the browser. And the, the, this border router has a small web server included that provides you an overview. The thing is here, um, now we just started the border router. There are no neighbors yet. So there's no routes. and um, there's nothing you, you can communicate with. So what we need is uh, sensor nodes or modes in, in the yeah, wireless sensor network lingo. And um, the best way to start is, uh, I would say, using Arium. Um, it's a co-op implementation in Contiki. And it provides you a nice uh, interface already to, to interact with the sensors, for instance, that are included on the T-Mode Sky. So um, it's located in examples, ER REST example. And there, for instance, you can just do a make target sky er example server dot upload. And here you can add mode equals two. Um, that avoids that um, the border auto you just um, flashed will be reprogrammed as well. So usually, if you don't add this mode equals something, all the connected modes will be flashed. So yeah, you, you want to do some planning and add this and, and only flash the ones you, you actually want to, to flash. OK, once you've done this, you waited some time to, for the mode to boot and to connect. Um, your website will look like this, and that's the nice thing. Now you, you see there's a neighbor. That's the mode you just flashed. And you see a route how to access or how to, to uh, address this, this mode. So you can copy um, this address, for instance, and use the copper Firefox plugin to yeah, talk co-op to, to the sensor node. So, you use this URI, so you have the co-op prefix, colon, slash, slash, and then this address we just saw on, on the web server on the border router. And then you have some yeah, features here. You can see discover, ping, and then the, the restful methods, get, post, put, delete, uh, to interact with this, as you can see on the uh, left-hand side, and then interact with, with um, the sensor node. If you're interested, uh, you can find this, this add-on in under this address. Yeah, and now we are actually done. We have connected our sensor network to the internet. And from from there, you can start build, build your applications. And a good way is to use co-op for that. So you have Arium running on the sensor node. And then, for instance, we have the California project at the Eclipse that you can use to, to implement the backend, uh, the controller, uh, the application, basically, um, yeah, on the website. So um, 
to, to, to run it somewhere in the cloud, to have it somewhere locally, but it's quite easy. You can develop it fully in Java and communicate with the sensor nodes. If you're interested, um, we have a nice tutorial um, called Hands-On with Co-op. Um, we presented this uh, at the EclipseCon in France uh, earlier this year. Um, here's a link, and that's, um, sorry, that's basically um, the part for the, the practical. I, I promised it in the, in the uh, abstract um, what's going on currently. So the next big step that we need is uh, the, the security for, for low power IP. So um, we need to make sure that um, it's interoperable. So we now have all this effort that we can communicate at the application layer, but we need to make this secure as well. And we need a scalable concept for that. So what's already included is uh, elliptic curve cryptography, which is pretty nice. Need to see whether we can make a public key cryptography also work on there. Nice approach already is this crypto hardware accelerator I already mentioned. And there's uh, quite some work going on in the ITF, for instance. Um, they are profiling DTLS to have a nice um, compact uh, specification for the use on sensor networks. And the other thing is uh, have authentication authorization directly on these small nodes. Uh, a big problem maybe that is uh, secure multicast. So that's also something that, that needs to be solved to, to yeah, use this nice paradigm that we have, for instance, with co-op, that we have group communication in a restful way. And that's already it. So if you have any questions, um, yeah, you can write an email. And um, I think there might be already quite some, some questions in, in the Hangout or Twitter. Yeah, uh, so, if, so if you I'm do done. have questions, um, so if you do have questions, um, uh, feel free to ask them in, in the Hangout. Um, if you want to use Twitter, I can, I'll, we'll follow the virtual IoT hashtag. Um, but I am hoping that um, yeah, most of the people here will just ask them in, in the Q&A. But um, it has a great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it, um, very, very practical. Um, and so I, I think uh, pe people get a lot out of it. Um, are there are there questions? I don't see any in the hay. It might have been a bit fast, so um, it's recorded. You can rewatch yep. it on YouTube. When do you see kind of these these types of sensor networks getting rolled out? It kind of it kind of what, what's what's the time frame? Do you see? Um, it's up? already happening, actually. So um, there there are several projects um, where in smart cities, for instance. Uh, Traffic um, sensors are connected with that. Uh, Barcelona has quite some startups that, that use this kind of technology, for instance. Um, I know that, uh, yeah, uh, Sexualbo with SensiNode or now ARM, uh, they're using this kind of technology uh, to, to, to have smart lighting, for instance, in, in right. larger cities. So it's, it's already happening. And uh, Co-op is definitely rolled out. And these sensor networks, um, yeah, they, they, they have been researched a lot. Um, the, the, most of them that are currently deployed are yeah, still running the old software, let's say. So they are very um, yeah, dedicated to, to the application. But there we have now this shift over because co-op is this successful to, to integrate, actually, these, sure. these sensors. Yeah. Actually, last night at the meetup, um, someone was talking about, uh, that what the presenter was talking about here in Ottawa, the, the water meters actually will transmit their the, the kind of the values to um, a, a sensor in the, the street lights and the street lights actually have a router to, to, to transmit the information mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's kind of fascinating kind of the technology that's being being rolled out that we just don't see too yeah um, so that's great are, are you familiar with all seen and all seen yeah uh, uh, was it a Samsung initiative uh, Qual Qualcomm Ah, Qualcomm, sorry yeah. for, for yeah. No, that's fine. That's right. up. Yeah. Um, I, I saw this popping up, but uh, at the moment I can't uh, discuss any details. Uh, um, yeah, no, I, I was just wondering how they, they kind of, are they sitting on top of this, uh, of uh, V6 or in, in the technology you're talking about or, or in parallel? Um, so. Yeah, so um, there, there, there are quite some, some activities. There's also this uh, threat group, for instance. They, they want to standardize this. Yeah. Um, the the thing is, so so six low pan is definitely there. So it's it's the way to connect um, sensors, actuators, and so on. The thing is, um, it, it's quite open. So you, there are these variations. You could use a slightly different configuration of the protocol and so on. So that's this profiling. So I, I already mentioned it for 
DTLS, for instance, that right. you know exactly what suit there, for instance, is is used, and then the same for 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 the IP layer. So now we we get see these these organizations that look into yeah okay what configuration do we need that everything actually works nicely together uh, with a yeah the expected quality of service basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and cer certainly security is is always going to be kind of whenever an, anyone talks about IoT, kind of usually the next thing out of their mouth is is well, what about security, right? So, yeah. um, so and so it's and this is it's just certainly DTLS, but um, um, just the East Group would be it'd be interesting to watch the East Group kind of come up to speed and and um, see what they they produce because it's going to be it's an important topic. Definitely, I mean. I would say now that we have this this internet technology for for the internet of things, so actual IP and so on, we can use the the strong mechanisms we have in in the internet. So what what basically is securing your your banking account from uh, on on the the e banking website can also protect your data uh, from from your smart meter or whatever sensor you deploy. So it's it's the best scaling security mechanism we have. So we should yeah. make use of it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right. Well, um, this seems like a shy group. Um, so, so no one's no one's asked a question. Um, so, I I, I thought it was, it was fascinating. I, I learned a lot. Um, and um, so, so thank you very much. Um, so, I did promise a, a question for anyone that wants to win um, uh, a greenhouse demo kit. Um, so, basically, the first person to send an email to iot at eclipse dot org um, with the answer to what is the IPv6 address. For local host, so we'll we'll see if, if people are following along very very carefully, or they, you can go back to the recording. Um, so so Matthias, th thank you very much um, for for it, and it was uh, great great to have you on. And um, everyone who joined us, thank you, and um, have a have a nice rest of the day. Take care. Sure, thank you a lot. <laughs>